Welcome back to Learning Solidity. Now in today's tutorial, I'll be following on from my previous tutorial where I started looking at multi-signature wallets. Now I'm going to address the big elephant in the room, which is something that was highlighted last time when I posted this video, that what I implemented last time wasn't in fact a multi-signature wallet, it was a shared wallet, which was correct. Because a multi-signature wallet, in essence, should work very similar to the blockchain. So you submit a transaction, which then has to be signed or processed um, by multiple parties. So in the case of our previous tutorial, we never actually went into the multi-authentication or the multi-signature aspect of the multi-signature um, wallet, which obviously was a little bit of a flaw. Um, another thing that was pointed out to me as well is there was a small little bug in our transfer to function, which had the message.sender.transfer, which obviously that should have simply been to uh, .transfer. So when you're obviously taking anything from these tutorials, be mindful that I probably am making bugs and it's not uncommon for me to make the odd mistake here and there. So in today's tutorial, what I'll be doing is looking at adding multi-authentication to a multi-signature wallet. So let's have a quick look at what we did last time. So we had the add owner, remove owner, which is absolutely fine. We had the fallback method, which um, is absolutely fine as well. Now the problems kind of lie in the withdraw and transfer to functions. So the first thing that I'm actually going to do with this, and I probably should have highlighted as well, last time I did the tutorial in Remix, this time I'm doing it in a combination of Atom with the Truffle framework. So all I've done is simply create a folder called, in this case, tutorial 25, run truffle in it, created the sort of scaffolding for the truffle uh, project, then created a new file called multisigwallet.sol, and then it just pasted the code from the previous tutorial. So inside this now, like I said, we should we need to look at these two methods, withdraw and transfer to. Now I'm, I'm gonna actually program this with some bugs in, in mind. Now the reason I'm doing that because to, I don't really want to develop a full multi-signature wallet in f for these tutorials. This is more of a trying to get a, an understanding of how a multi-signature wallet should work. And obviously last time I was a bit off the mark, so this time I kind of want to get it right, but don't really want to cover every single little aspect. I will highlight bugs that I'm aware of, such as with this multi-signature wallet implementation that we're going to do, um, with our shared wallet in this case, um, we had this require where we were checked to see if the balance was uh, greater than or equal to the amount being withdrawn. Now, obviously, if you're doing a multi-signature wallet where the transactions don't um, execute instantaneously, what essentially is going to happen is that you can check that value, but then you kind of have to also check the amount which will be available after all the uh, pending transactions have been executed as well. So obviously um, with a multi-signature, you need to just queue up the transactions rather than execute them directly. Okay, so the key thing about this is removing the ability to transfer funds. So let's get rid of that and get rid of that because we don't want to actually transfer anything in either of those two methods. What we need to do is create a transaction sort of queuing system. Now, I actually have um, an implementation in mind for this, which is what I'm going to do. Now, the first thing um, that we need to add for this, this multi-transaction thing is um, a transaction sort of representation, or in this case, I've created a struct for this transaction. So our transaction has a few properties. So let's create a struct transaction. Let's cover the basics. So we're gonna have an address from, we're gonna have an address to, we're gonna have a unit amount. And that's just the basics. But we need to add a couple of little things to this transaction. We need to add how many people have signed it, and also who signed it. So let's create two variables on that. We need a uint8 and that's signature count. And we then need to create a mapping because obviously we don't want more than one person to sign this uh, contract, or sorry, sign this transaction. So therefore we need to keep a record of who signed this actual transaction. So I'm gonna do that simply with a mapping and address to a uint Eight, which is just going to be a one or a zero just to check if that person has signed it or not and um, call that sig signatures okay so now we have our little transaction representation what we need to do 
is creates a sort of like a queuing mechanism or, or sort of an array for these transactions. So to do this, I'm going to do it in two ways. Now, the reason I'm doing it in two ways is because um, one, I want to use a map to map a transaction ID essentially to a transaction, but I also want to have a map of active transactions because obviously you can't call a map directly and get like a list of available transactions. We have to store that somewhere else. So what I'm going to do is simply create a mapping again, and this mapping is going to be a mapping of a uint because our transaction ID is just going to be a simple uint uh, to a transaction. And we're going to make it uh, private, and we're just simply going to call that underscore transactions. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to need is active transactions or transactions that are currently waiting pending. I should probably call them pending transactions to be honest. So we're going to call create a uint and we're going to make this a dynamic array because this is obviously going to be changing constantly because it's stored in the storage mechanism that should have no issue. Now we're going to make that private again and we're also going to call that pending transactions. Okay so those are our two sort of like data stores for our transactions that are currently pending and, and basically need to be processed. So and now I've made a reference already that I'm going to be using a uint as a transaction ID in these two places. So to actually create a, a dynamic uint, um, what I'm simply going to do is just create a uint, make it private, and then call it transaction index. So every time that you add a transaction, what that'll do, that'll be the transaction ID and it'll increment. So essentially just an auto increment in transaction ID. It's a very simple thing. It's very similar like if you were doing this in MySQL where you'd have a, um, a primary key as an auto incrementing integer. And the final thing that I want to add to this is just simply a constant that says that we need X amount of signatures to sign this contract, to sign this transaction. So let's create a uint again. Let's call it, um, let's just call it constant. And let's say, um, let's call it min min signatures. So because it's also being a constant, we need to define it. So we're going to state it's a, a value of two. So we need a minimum of two signatures before a transaction is authorized and therefore can be actually used. Okay, so let's delve down a bit. Now we had these withdraw funds and transfer funds. Um, we need to expand on these two events as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually have the full sequence of the transaction event logged as well. So the first thing we're going to do is transaction created. And we need an address from. We need to have that as an address to. We still need the amount, but we also this time need the transaction ID because we need to keep a log of what was um, created and, and so forth. So let's call that transaction ID. Same thing with the transfer funds, except we're going to change transfer funds to transaction completed. We're going to have an address. Oh wait, that one should have been from from to unit amount and unit transaction ID. Just so we have a complete audit log. Now we're going to add one little thing to this as well. <coughs> Sorry, uh, that basically keeps us uh, keeps a track of who's signing the transactions, um, and we're just going to call it event transaction signed and that's going to be address by and then simply event transaction id so that's covered the uh, set of events that we need to log for this uh, for these transactions to go through so now let's have a quick look at our withdraw and transfer to me mechanisms. Now, because we've actually removed that event data, let's go ahead and create that, remove those. Now we can already see that the, the functionality of the two, two, me two methods essentially, or two functions is identical. The only difference is one takes a parameter of two and the other doesn't. So let's cut down the overhead of all these functions. We can even get rid of that um, modifier because if we simply call, transfer to and then do message dot sender and then pass the amount in we're also we're automatically going to get we're automatically going to hit that uh, sort of custom modifier anyway so we don't need it in the first function now that might be a little bit of a security nit, uh, nit bit that someone's probably saying you probably should put it there anyway but either way i'm gonna leave it out for now okay so we have our now transfer to function our transfer to function um like i've mentioned previously uh, has this require so 
in here, we're checking to see if the current balance is applicable to the actual amount being transferred to. Now, the problem, like I previously mentioned, that is if there is a queued set of transactions waiting, this is technically not correct because then you're trying to potentially transfer more than is actually available. Say, for instance, if you have 10 Ether in the account and you have 10 transactions already queued that transfer one Ether each, then you add a 11th transaction. Obviously, you're going to hit this, and the first thing you're going to check to see is address this dot balance greater or equal to the amount, which it always will be, um, regardless of the fact that you've queued up 11 Ethers worth of transactions. Now, there's also like a, a catch-22 in this as well, that you, go, you could simply state, okay, um, what happens if I wanted to check the amount of Ether of all the transactions that are currently pending, which is fine, and that would be a very applicable way to do it. The only issue is if you had one of the transactions queued lingering that you wouldn't, didn't want to process, or this was a very important transaction that you wanted to get through, whereas the other transactions might not have been so important. And then you you sort of like running into problems. Um, I'm not going to address this in this tutorial. I've, I've you know that those are the two options that I would have sort of gone for if I would have if I was going to implement this. Is first obviously um, checking to see if all the queue transactions were available, or simply move this down to your sort of like finalized function where you're actually you, you're actually sending the ether to that specific transaction. Um, in that case, then it doesn't matter. the transaction could in theory fail. Um, but it would still allow you to get the transaction, you know, your important transaction through that you really wanted to. But for now, I'm just going to leave it as is. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Each transaction is going to require a transaction ID. We've already stated that we have a transaction ID. So uh, using the transaction index. So our transaction ID is simply going to be underscore transaction index plus plus. So that means that, for instance, this is going to start on zero. So the first transaction is going to be zero. And then when you call this, it will simply increment the next call to this as two. So therefore, that's always going to be unique up until the maximum you in 256-bit uh, like sort of integer, which is a phenomenally big number. Trust me, like a 32-bit integer is what, like, I think two or four billion or something like that unsigned. Um, can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, if you look into it, I'm sure you'll be able to find it quite easily. A uh, little side note that YouTube used to have a 32-bit unsigned, I don't, actually can't remember if it was signed or unsigned integer, but Gangnam Style actually broke YouTube with the, uh, it actually exceeded that value. So yeah, that's uh, obviously always going to be a massive value. And to be honest, if you actually exceeded that value, you probably exceed in the amount of combinations that would ever be executed on the Ethereum network anyway. So that's a pretty safe bet to use that. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is now start creating our transaction. We've already defined the struct. So we're first going to create a transaction. Now, the first thing I want to pick up on here is this, because we're defining a struct, we we need to define it in a, in a sort of like a memory context, so whether we're going to be defining it in storage, memory, uh, so forth. Now, there are kind of only two ways to do this, either storage or memory. So because we're defining it inside, um, inside the scope of this function, um, we need to define it in memory. I think by default, it will define it in memory anyway, but it'll actually, the debugger, um, my sure, trans spot right. So the debugger or remix will actually pick this up potentially as an issue. So just uh, use the keyword memory, and obviously you it is clearer to the user and clearer to the reader that that is actually part of the memory. So so we now have our transaction. Okay, so we need to add some things to our transaction. Let's start with the basics. Our trans action has several member attributes and the first one is going to be from and because we're actually going to keep this quite explicit it's going to be the message dot sender every time because that's where the transactions come from we then have transaction dot two because we already have a two address um which is passed into this function we can simply say two we can then have a transaction dot amount which is going to be the amount passed in or requested then finally we're going to have the transaction dot sig Count. Have I spelled right? Signature count. That looks wrong to me. Okay. Either way, but we're going to have that as zero because obviously no one should have signed that by now. And the person creating the transaction shouldn't be able to sign the transaction either. So the next thing that we need to do, well now we have our fully fledged transaction, which is essentially what uh, 
this block is here. This is our transaction. Obviously, this is our transaction ID. We now want to start adding our transaction to the data structures. So let's add first to transactions. Now we need to create the key, which is going to be the transaction ID. And we're simply going to state that it's going to be the transaction. We also need to add this to active transactions. So if you're querying a list of transactions, you could see that this is still pending. Uh, so pending transactions um, dot push, forget dynamic arrays in memory, in a storage, requires the dot push mechanism. And then we're simply going to put the transaction ID because you can always reference the transaction um, ID from the transactions. So, I mean, you can always re reference the transaction from the transactions using the transaction ID. So that's all we need to obviously reference this transaction. And then the final thing that we're going to do is just simply log that the transaction was created. It was created from message.sender. It was created to that specific address, the amount, and obviously the transaction ID is going to be the same as well. So now we have our creating uh, our transaction or sort of the creation of the, uh, the, the sort of pending transaction, should we say. So the next thing that we want to do is I'm actually just going to jump in and do a little, in, a little intimate here and just basically say create a little function that allows us to get a list of all the active transactions. So if you go to function, um, we're going to call it to get um, pending transactions. And then we're simply going to state that you've got to be a valid owner. Um, it's a public um, function and also it returns a uint. Uh, unit array. So that's all that it needs to be. Now to return that we simply need to return the pending transactions. And there we have a list of sorry a, a list of valid pending transactions. Okay, so the next thing that we want to be able to do now is sign a transaction. Now in the signing of the transaction, I also want the ability to sort of execute the transaction because the transaction once signed, if it hits the minimum required amount of signatures should then automatically be executed. So let's first create a function. Let's call this assign transaction. Let's simply also specify a uint because that's gonna be the transaction ID that we are going to be signing. Um, you need to be a valid owner. You need it to be public and no, we're not going to return anything. Okay, so that's our signing function. Okay, so the first things that we need to do is that we need to get this transaction. Okay, so we can simply state um, transaction because we want to get this transaction structure. Now, just a side note, before, because we created the structure, we had to specify the keyword memory. Now we're pulling in the structure from a storage mechanism. So therefore, without to basically stop the, um, the EVM uh, from duplicating the actual object, instead of referencing it directly, um, sorry, instead of, yeah, sorry, I was right the first time, instead of actually causing the EVM to duplicate the object, we want to reference it directly. So therefore, we simply state storage. And then we create a variable name called transaction and simply state transactions and then the transaction ID. Now, this is now created a reference point for us in the storage mechanism. So we've not actually just duplicated a load of unnecessary data in the EVM. So the next thing that we need to do is then check this transaction. Now, we can't do any direct validation on the transaction itself to make sure that for instance um it exists um, what i mean by that is you can't do anything like require um transaction because obviously it's not going to return a boolean value and therefore will error now this isn't highlighting the fact that that's an error but it is trust me so we can't do anything like um zero equal require not equals transaction either what we need to do is something like zero to uh, what you could use zero as well to be fair i just like doing that when i'm using addresses is not equal to the transaction dot from because it will create a sort of like a stub structure of it anyway even though it doesn't exist and therefore it requires the transaction to actually exist i should leave a little note there transaction must exist so the next thing that we also want to check as well is we require that the message dot sender is not the transaction dot from because we don't want the creator of the transaction to be signing this either so um 
greater cannot assign the transaction. And then finally, we want a last check as well. Um, we also want to make sure, even though it's not potentially the creator, we want to make sure that this person has not already signed this. So we're going to require that the message, the, the transaction, sorry, dot um, signatures message dot sender is not equal to one because every time that we sign a transaction, uh, you you essentially get that flag set against your um, signature that you've actually signed it and it all set it to one so um cannot sign than once okay so you should be able to sign a transaction more than once the next thing is basically creating the those sort of rules um, and what i mean by those sort of rules is first let's sign the let's sign the transaction so it's transaction signatures message dot sender is equal to one now that's now set to one so therefore obviously if it's called again that's going to fail the next thing we also need to do is set the transaction dot signature count and basically increment it by one as well because now we have incremented we've now had a new signature so therefore it's now been signed we can also log this as well so transaction signed by the message dot sender and using that specific transaction id okay so the next thing that we need to do in this function now i know this is probably you're probably sitting there saying this is quite a lot to be in a function eh, it's not too bad um i've seen a lot worse and um, we now want to check to see if our transaction has had enough signatures that can actually be completed so if the transaction dot signature count i just want to check that i don't actually call it signature count and i am actually spelling it right uh, signature counter seemingly so um is more than or equal to i can't remember what i called the other variable min signatures min, min signatures so if the signature count is more than or equal to min signatures we are now in a state that we can actually um we can now validate this transaction so in fact, what I will do is to make this a little bit easier for everyone, is I'm going to remove that transfer to function there. Actually, no, I'm going to leave it in. And I'm actually going to put it down here as well. So we can't send any more than what is available to us within the wallet anyway. Then we're simply going to state that transaction transfer the amount. So we're going to send the um, that specific person that set amount. We are then going to complete the transaction or sort of log the fact that the transaction was completed. So that's going to be the trans action dot from transaction dot to the amount, which is the transaction dot amount. And then the transaction ID is still valid. Okay, the final thing we want to do is a little bit of a cleanup function. So what we need is another function now called function delete transaction. So it's uint takes transaction id. Obviously, we don't want people to be accessing this. Um, we might want them to access this externally, but first things first, we only want a valid owner to be able to access this, this externally. And I keep doing that whole comma thing. I need to get out of doing that. Um, so we only need a, an owner to be able to delete a transaction. Obviously, then if we're going to do that, we, we can create public. Otherwise, we should have created private. Now, this is a bit of an elongated function. I, I did have a bit of back and forth to see which is the best way to do this. Obviously, there might be a better way to do this. But for now, this is kind of what I went with. We're going to create a uint8, uh, just a simple Boolean in essence. I'm going to call it replace and call it equal zero. Because we need to know um, if we're actually got anything to replace or what's the point essentially in our array that we need to replace sorry i should have explained that a little bit better now um i'm kind of half reading code here on the left and trying to sort of explain it on and, and sort of recode it essentially on the right so what we need to do um because we have two maps or an array and a map it's very easy to delete an element from a map it's simply a case of delete um transaction transaction id 
and that's it that's gone that's deleted from the map so that's fine now to delete from an array a dynamic array we've got a little bit more to do uh, deleting from a static array is quite simple and quite straightforward all you need to do is essentially reshuffle the um, the index the elements around just so you've got a consistent index flow but we need to do the same thing with the tran with the actual dynamic array as well the only difference is that we also need to modify the actual uh, counters as well because the counters don't get updated so to do this we need to do a few things so we first need to delete um, the element of, from the array. And by doing that, what I mean is replace the existing element within the array. Okay, so this that might sound a, bit, a, little, a little bit complicated. So let's just start programming this. So, okay, so we need to uh, loop over the array. So let's create a uint i equals zero. i is less than the pending transactions dot length. And also, I need to increment on every sort of pass. Okay, that's the basics. Now, what we need to do is we need to find this transaction point. So, we need to find um, if the transaction ID is equal to the pending transactions I. So, therefore, that is now the replace point. Well, and what I mean by that is that if that flag is now set, we are now replacing every value from uh, that point onwards. And we do that by simply stating another if uh, statement here. So if one is equal to replace, we simply state that the pending transactions minus, uh, sorry, i minus one is equal to pending transactions i. So essentially, um, I'll just quickly show you what I mean by that. If you have an index of like, let's just say zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the values are 55, 54, I don't know, 25, whatever. So you, you get what I mean. It, there is no requirement for this. These actually should all be unique. So let's just try and unique them up a bit. Okay, so we've got a, a set of unique values here. Now, our unique values um, need to be need to be looked up essentially. So I'm going to pass in, for instance, the value 29. Now, our for loop, which is what we've got here, is first going to check the first value. It's not 29, and then the second value is not 54, none of that. and then we'll get down to here. So this point here is now marked that the replace is equal to one. We've not done anything for those um, previous sort of array elements because we've already um, we've already assumed that they're not valid they're not applicable and we want to maintain that array index now we need to get rid of this most people say oh just delete it um, it doesn't work like that we have to delete it and then reshuffle the array it's a bit it, it can be a little bit elongated so it, it it is a bit of a pain to understand so now we've identified that point three or the index point of three has the value that we have one here so we've already identified that and now the replace flag is set to one so we loop over again and we arrive at point 26. so point 26 we can simply state that we want to swap 26 for 29. we then loop over again then set 27 to 26 and finally loop over to the final element number six and move 67 to 27 so now we have two elements but the thing is we've removed that element and maintained the order now this last thing that we would simply do then is delete the final element and then decrement the index of sorry decrement the length of the array so then we should get rid of that that should then maintain the obviously the the sort of the index the correct index flow of the array and therefore we've removed the array uh, element correctly it, i think it's also known as splicing uh, array elements obviously if you come from like a javascript context but unfortunately it doesn't have those basic tools available to us so we've got to program them now with the fact that we've already identified this as replace equals one we're already at this state here so we don't need to check that again so we could simply wrap that in an else if so now that is now an else if, and we don't need to process it again, which saves a little bit of um, iterations on the processing time, which obviously cut down gas costs. So we're replacing each of those elements or we're replacing the previous element with the current element. So obviously we're shuffling the array backwards. And then once we finish that, we simply state delete um, pending transactions. 
um, and then pending transactions dot length minus one because obviously we've got to count in the fact that the array indexes start at zero not one but obviously the length will start at one and then go up and then simply state that the pending transactions dot length is decremented by one and there is the simplest way well what i perceive is the simplest way to sort of reshuffle an array now hopefully i haven't screwed that up and i've got that right it looks right from what i've actually got now one last thing that i'm actually going to do to this oh what i forgot to do is also now delete the transaction because it has been completed so delete the transaction id and therefore we can now delete the transaction you could put in some log in there if you wanted to delete a transaction or void a transaction but that's kind of subjective to you the last thing i want to do is because i'm actually going to do a quick couple of tests on this using remix and to do this i also want to include a function called wallet balance now i know what i did say a few times that i wanted to go into this um with the whole sort of like testing in um in truffle but i'll do that in a later tutorial i have actually got a few test cases over here that actually are applicable to this but like i say that's coming up in a future tutorial so we want to make that constant we're going to make that public now it can't be pure because pure does not give us access to constants and what i mean by that is if you do public um, returns the uint and then return a address uh, this dot balance what the hell is that one? Shut up. So, because we're using that, if I was to change that to pure, that would no longer work because that would not give me access to that function call or that sort of member attribute. So, that needs to be constant, which is absolutely fine. And if I'm correct, that should have covered everything that I wanted to implement. Did I miss anything? I don't think so. So what I'm going to do is open a new window of Remix. Uh, I just want to do this just to show you this working. I'm going to copy all this over. I'm going to save it. because I'm going to leave this in a Truffle project for us. Um, I'm going to create... Yeah, I'll move over here. Get rid of that. Get some zooming in going on. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Let's create a new... Um, multi sig wallet let's paste that what is that not happy with um oh it's already found out that we've made a mistake and we found out that we made another mistake it's more than equal to the trend action dot amount what's that not happy about the same thing okay um function get pending transactions what was wrong with that one Uh, that because it is applicable we can make that as a view because it's readable and i think that should have addressed everything i'm just going to quickly chuck that back into here with those corrections in place now we can actually test this so by testing it we're going to change to the environment java virtual machine we're going to start with the the top uh, ether account we're going to now create a contract now there may be an actual way to actually obtain uh, oh yeah there's down here so we want the first account because we need to add some owners so if i copy the first account paste it into add owner um, duh, 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 why did it not like that because that doesn't look like a valid owner id well, that should be fine um add to owner oh I was, I was trying to add it as the wrong owner that should have been fine yeah so that should have failed correctly now if i take the third address copy that switch back to this this is just allowing us to have multiple owners to test this against so if i now add that owner okay we should now have two owners um which are now set against the account we should have a wallet balance of zero get pending transaction zero um as the master account we, let's add 100 ether to this so if i now call the callback method as the owner of the account I call the get wallet balance we now have a valid balance okay now as the owner of the contract i am going to request a withdrawal of 100 we now we can see 
the balance is still not changed, but the transaction should now be pending. So if I call Ben and get pending transactions, we have a transaction ID of zero available to us. So if I try and sign this as this owner, so sign transaction, just transaction zero, it should error, which is what I expect it to do. Then if I go down to my first valid owner, sign the transaction, which is absolutely fine because it's a valid one. Let's just try and sign it as a owner, which we know is invalid. Um, let's sign that transaction. Again, that failed because we expected it to. Now, if we jump down to the third owner, this should sign the contract and complete it if I've done everything correctly. Okay, so that's now signed the wallet, uh, signed the transaction. And hopefully, if I'm correct, if I now call the wallet balance, we're now down 100 Wii. If I do the get pending transactions, we have now been reduced um, to no trans transaction pending. And I probably should have checked, but hopefully that should now have a hundred extra we. But uh, it's kind of neither here nor there because that's kind of screwed up the whole interface. I've now got no point, no, 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 no. But either way, oh yeah, I did actually send it a hundred uh, ether, didn't I? So that might have screwed that up slightly. Either way, there we go. We now have what in essence should be a multi-signature wallet where you can create a transaction. You have to have multiple people sign the transaction before any transaction is a, is sort of like valid or sort of can be completed. And in essence, now that hopefully should have uh, rectified the original tutorial I did on the um, uh, sort of multi-signature wallets. The next thing I want to do is I want to go into testing. Now, to show you what I was kind of doing in the last slot, I don't want to go into this too much because it's kind of what I want to next time, is that I was writing some tests and especially what I was writing was more along the lines of checking to see if users had access and I was doing some little bits and pieces with the truffle sort of exception case of capturing and so forth. But I'll leave that for tutorial what should be 26. Now, uh, I hope you found this, use this tutorial useful. I will be posting it up on GitHub and YouTube within the moment. So obviously this should be coinciding of the two. Um, if you did find it useful, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, leave it in the comments box down below. I usually try and get back to almost everyone. I think there's very few comments I haven't got back to. Um, I do apologize if it was a valid question you were asking me. Often I try and ignore the comments or questions that are trying to get me to do work for them or um, just purely advertising. Um, with that being said, um, if you hit the subscribe button, you'll be kept up to date with all my latest videos. So you'll obviously be notified the next time I actually do this sort of multi-signature wallet testing, which I'm hoping is going to be sooner rather than later, because I know there's been a bit of a two week gap between this one. And with that being said, I hope you found this useful and I'll catch you next time.